Welcome back to our series on the history of important Galicianers. Zionists, we know, come mostly in Galicia from the Polonized intellectuals. Many didn't even know Yiddish. The movement needed to reach the masses, and labeled Taubus was one of the key figures that allowed them to do this. Taubus was the sign of generations of respected rabbis on both his paternal and maternal sides. He grew up in Otinia, just outside Stanislav, from age five after his father took a position there as rabbi. He is unique among the Zionist leaders in his provincial origins and in his strictly traditional upbringing. For many Zionists, Jewish nationalism represented a third way between assimilation and orthodoxy, a positive but secular Jewish identity that advocated an unhyphenated Jewish national identity. Taubus remained religiously observant his entire life, strongly protesting, for example, the scheduling of the 1905 Austrian Zionist Conference on the holiday of Shavuot. His, converse, his conversion to Zionism, he later wrote, was a result not of abandonment of traditional Judaism, as it was for so many, but rather of a new conviction that the national ideal was a natural and integral part of traditional Judaism. As he writes, even as a very young man, I began to feel on my own that the standing of our Jews is not so good. I felt that we lacked something, only I didn't know the right name for what it was that we lacked. For a long time, as a consequence of my upbringing, of my environment, and of my entire Jewish milieu at that time, I felt that Jews merely lacked proper fear of heaven. With time, however, I began to feel that aside from world-to-come issues, we actually lacked our complete I, our complete soul. We lacked the feeling and the understanding for the Jewish spark, that which we call today Jewish nationhood. In truth, Taubus' actual path to Zionism was born as much out of his desire to improve the Jews' desperate poverty as, for his, as out of his search for a more complete soul. But Zionism remained for Taubus a movement that strengthens Torah rather than one which opposed it. Zionism proclaimed, he once wrote, that a Jew is not unfortunately a Jew, but a proud son of his great ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a true follower not of new teachings of a Torah Hadasha, but only of our ancient, holy, exalted Torah of Moses. Similarly, he described the dinner reception following the third party conference of Galician Zionists in 1895, an affair filled with secular men, as being truly, quote, a table upon which there were said words of Torah. Taubus applauded Western Jews for joining the Zionist movement, but was careful to frame their activity as a return to traditional Judaism itself, to preempt orthodox charges that Zionism constituted a heresy. On the contrary, he argued, Zionism was itself an extension of traditional Judaism. Naturally, he wrote, we religious Jews believe more than the progressives in the rebuilding of the Jewish state. It fills us with special joy that we see our ancient lofty hope and the belief in the rebuilding of the Jewish kingdom winning supporters among the modern educated progressive Jews. We celebrate that our educated Jews are becoming familiar with the Fulksy day. We are proud to hear from a man like Dr. Herzl, we are a people. We are not Germans, Poles, Frenchmen, or Russians. We are a people, a people, Jews. Israel, Goy, Echad. And then, boldly referring to the Jewish state as Olam Haba, the Messianic Age, Talbot confidently concluded that faith and nationalism were natural bedfellows. Quote, we know that every Jew has a place in the world to come, he wrote. All Jews may have a share in the future Jewish state, in the future Jewish world. Nationalism leads to faith. Faith leads to nationalism. Taubus' populist religious Zionism does not simply anticipate the emergence of religious Zionism. No, it was an expression of Jewish nationalism beyond Zionism. His real importance was his ability to speak both literally and metaphorically to traditional Yiddish-speaking Jews. Many memoirs recall the impact of his provincial Yiddish spoken behind a strimal gartel and capote. He was also one of the earliest advocates of Yiddish language propaganda, publishing a series of Yiddish language nationalist newspapers beginning in 1890. 
the years of Volkzeitung in 1890, 91, their Volksfreund in 1891, 92, Ha'am das Volk in 1895 to 97, all in the provincial deep southeast, especially Kolomea and, and Tizminitsa. To be sure, Tabus was deeply moved by their Judenstadt and even published a Yiddish transliteration. He immediately joined the WZO and worked with Herzl. And when Galician Zionist organizations was founded in Lviv, he was a founding member there as well. But these were not Zionist papers. They were nationalist and focused mostly on Galician Jewish needs, never using the word Zionist. The goal was to politicize traditional Jews, nationalize their identity, and convince them to claim their national rights in Galicia. He opposed religious reform and secularism, but also anti-modern ultra-orthodoxy. Quote, we cannot accept as good when one closes himself to every innovation, every modern institution which contemporary times demand, without which one almost cannot live. He tried to establish a modern Jewish elementary school that would teach Hebrew language, unlike the haters, and secular subjects, but was blocked by the rabbis. He presented himself as a better, more authentic defender of the faith than his rabbinic opponents, blaming them especially for not caring about Jews in public schools, forced to work on Shabbat and holidays, ignorant of traditions. Taubus was an early supporter of diaspora Jewish nationalist activity, of Landespolitik, of Zionists winning national rights in Galicia. For example, his papers pushed Jews to risk a fine and jail and answer that their national language was Yiddish on the decennial sentence. When the fifth voting curia was opened to all men, in 1897, Taubus pushed for the movement to nominate candidates throughout Galicia and even suggested formation of a Jewish national party in parliament years before anyone else caught on. And when universal manhood suffrage finally opened in 1907 and the movement committed itself to run candidates in some two dozen districts, he didn't just run for office himself in Przemyszwani Zlochov. He went on a campaign spree across the province, opening the minds of tens of thousands of Jews to the idea of Jewish nationhood and political activism. I recognized that with this crowd he described, one would have to begin from the political ABCs, that the poor, oppressed Jews had no understanding of the most primitive political concepts. But I also recognized that this was an audience thirsting for enlightenment. And when I spoke, I saw how the audience really came to life and listened eagerly, intensely to every word. Every word was for them a revelation, a sort of prophecy. After I finished my lecture around midnight, an old Jew came to me and said, Mr. Taubus, admittedly what you have told us is truly very interesting and completely correct. I want to ask you one question, however. Why are we hearing this now? for the first time. Taubus and men like him, but there was no one quite like him, helped Zionists overcome their image of being a movement of disillusioned secular intellectuals. Zionist propaganda emphasized over and over his religious upbringing and his observance as populist credentials. He was, wrote one paper, and remains a child of the people, one of the great Jewish masses. His parents left him no great inheritance. He made no university degree in order to acquire a privileged higher status in society. And when Label Tabas became a Zionist, he did not go down to the people, but rather came up from the people. He did not come from a different world. He was not pushed to Zionism through rejection, through anti-Semitism, but only from inside himself. From his folk's neshama, he generated his enthusiasm for Zionism and for everything that is Jewish. Label Taubus thus became a Zionist, not like many of our intellectuals through his head, but through his heart. And Taubus cultivated this deliberately. For example, he usually dressed modern, but when he came to a traditional shtetl like Glina for Shabbos, he entered shul wearing a kaftan and a gartel, quote, exactly like all the Jews in the shtetl, recalls one man. When he did finally speak, Taubus' striking dark hair, European manners, and beautiful soft Yiddish won over the town. I am a Jew who lives with the Jewish people, he said. I live, who lives with the great poor and slave, depressed, but honorable Jewish folk masses. I don't consider myself, God forbid, any higher, any more honorable, any greater than the people. I am one 
of the people. I know the pain of our people, our oppressed condition, our difficult struggle for existence, our desperate needs, our wishes, and our demands, not just in theory from books alone. No, I know this all from life, from our, from our hard, difficult Jewish life. I feel our people's pains. I feel them with all of my senses. And that is why I have the courage, my brothers, to ask you your, for your trust, to enable me to work for the good of our folks' masses at that place where one must go to work, in the parliament. Summarizing his activities from before World War I, Taubes could list over 132 towns in Galicia and Bukovina where he estimated speaking at thousands of rallies before some quarter million Jews. By 1907, other Zionist leaders had become accomplished Yiddish speakers, but none were so uniformly credited with the conquest of traditional Jewry. Without label Taubes, one wrote, we would have won for our movement perhaps a small class of the secondary intelligentsia and perhaps some gymnasium and university students. Label Taubes led the Jewish masses into the ranks of our fighters. His passing in 1933 in Vienna, home to many Galician exiles, was widely mourned among the Zionists, though unfortunately he has fallen into obscurity since then. Thank you.